Hi, my name is Don Hurd. I'm here in Billings, Montana. I'm going to put this video together, uh, starting with basic hand loading for centerfire rifles. And then we're going to go into centerfire pistol, and then also into advanced reloading for the long range target shooter, varmint shooter type person. I'm going to try to cover this very simply step by step. And that way you'll get a good basic idea and understanding of some of the basics needed. And then as you progress through your loading, you will learn that you can make much, much better ammunition by doing certain other things to the cases. So we'll cover those step by step. The first thing you're going to need is a good sturdy bench. This particular one was made out of an old desk. And you want to position your reloading press if you're right-handed to the right side so you have a place to sit. You want to have ample tabletop area and keep it clean at all times. This particular bench was developed over a 30-40 year period of experience <coughs> in using different benches. And this one was by far the easiest one to put together. Just an old desk and then a couple boards up on top. You can see where the dies are. The board is put on a 45 degree angle, a slant with a series of holes drilled in them. Well, let's take a closer look. Here you can see the tooling section. I just put a board up at a 45 degree angle and drilled some holes in it, appropriate hole sizes. These are different bullet puller collets in case you make a mistake or you want to change bullets or whatever. You need to pull the bullets. So I have them arranged in the correct order. This is the bullet puller. This is a series of inside neck reamers, which I very seldom ever use, but when you need one, it's a nice thing to have. These are uh, cartridge case holders for Wilson. This is a case trimmer and neck turner. These are the pilots for my Forrester neck turning tool, which I use for outside neck turning. An overall case or cartridge length gauge. A good quality, this particular one happens to be a Sterrett dial caliper, and also a uh, RCBS case master for checking run out, and a couple of magnifying glass. Now, all these things are not necessary for a beginner who is just starting out with his first box of shells to reload. It's something that you can get into progressively. So we'll learn more about that later. And just below that, we have our die rack. This is our die rack, the same situation with a 45 degree angle board with a series of holes drilled in it where I have the dies somewhat but not necessarily in the correct order with all of the shell holders below. And I do believe here I have just about every shell holder except for one. And it's something that you do not need but I had just happened to collect them over, over many years. And you can set up a board like this if you have as many dies like I do. But it's not necessary. Your standard good old die box will more than suffice and just put it in the desk drawer. The first thing that we want to do with the cartridge cases that's provided their new cases is to run them all through a resizing die. As you can see by this particular case, if you inspect all of them, you'll find quite a, quite a number of them have dent necks. So we need to make them all uniform. By doing this, we set up the reloading die with the full length resizer and the expander ball and run the cases through it once and it will come out in perfect condition. This happens to be a new batch of Winchester factory cases. As you can see when they come out, the necks are crumbled, bent, twisted. Therefore, all of them need to be run through a sizing die to make the next round. Your reloading die as it comes out of the box will look something like this. What it is, is a barrel that's very carefully machined to the correct dimensions. Inside, there's a decapping rod, your decapping pin, and your expander ball. You want to inspect the inside of the die by looking through it to make sure it's clean and shiny. If there's any residue in there, you have to be very, very careful uh, to take something soft, like a very, very soft piece of wood or plastic, 
and clean it out with a uh, piece of Kleenex or soft tissue. And then look through both ends and make sure that you, it's clear all the way through. If you'll note on the side, right here there's a tiny little hole that can occasionally get plugged up with residue and resizing, uh, dye lube, uh, various things like that. So it's very important to keep these dyes cleaned at all times. What we need to do now is to screw the die into the press. First we need to run the ram all the way to the top, then screw the die all the way down until it touches the top of the ram when the ram is in the up position. We insert shell holder in this particular case, I believe this one's a number three, because we're going to be loading for 30 odd six or 30 government. I always turn the shell holder because I'm right-handed so that I can easily put a cartridge in from the left-hand side. These dies I have used before, so I'm going to I'm going to reset them. With the ram in the upward position, we continue to screw the die down until it touches the top of the ram. Then we release the ram and turn it between one-eighth and one-quarter of a turn farther down. Once you make that slight correction between an eighth and a quarter of a turn and the shell holder hits the bottom of the die, you'll feel it cam over and you'll hear a very positive clunk. Then you know your die is seated properly for full-length resizing. The next thing to do is to put in the decapping pin and expander ball. And you want that to protrude about 3 16 of an inch below the base of the die. <clears throat> so that when the cartridge case is all the way in, it protrudes through the shell holder and expels the used primer. Just snug that down and now our die is completely ready to go. We're ready to size a case. This is what it should look like from the bottom. When the ram comes up, the decapping pin and the case go up inside and the primer is kicked out. If for any reason it doesn't kick out, you simply make another adjustment and give it another turn until the primers come out on a consistent basis. Now we need to lock the ring into position. I'm using a set screw. Just turn it in so it's snug but not tight. There, now we're ready to go. If we were going to use cases that have already been once fired, there's one additional step that we might consider doing. Taking a fired case, <clears throat> this is a 30 odd 6 case that's been fired, to resize it, we make sure it's clean, we inspect it, make sure the primer pocket is good, make sure there's no cracks or splits in the neck, I happen to use Imperial Sizing Dye Wax, but there are a number of sprays and others that are available. This only takes a tiny bit. I rub it on my fingers, give it a slight twist, and come all the way down like that. If you can see any lube on there, you've got too much. If you can feel it, it's just about right. If you put too much lube on here, after you run it through the dye, it's entirely possible that you can get a big dent in the side of your case. Sometimes they'll shoot out and other times they won't. If they won't, discard the case. Now, a little trick that I learned <coughs> many years ago is to take something like a cigarette lighter and just blacken a portion of the cartridge case, put a little bit of soot on it so that you can see where the die is going to make contact on it. 
in cases of bolt action rifles or single shots, if you're going to use the same ammunition in the same rifle, it's not necessary to full length resize it every time. Neck resizing will work. So you can adjust your die very simply by raising it up slightly. And lock the ring. So it will turn, screw it back to its position, and then I'll back off, oh, maybe a turn or so, and then tighten the, the die back down. Now I'll insert the smoked case, run it to the top of the ram. The primer has been kicked out, and now I can visually see how far. I've actually resized that, and on my first shot, it looks like it's just about perfect. There has been no contact whatsoever with the die body on the shoulder of the case. This gives this particular case zero headspace in the same rifle it was fired in. Now, chambers will vary from rifle to rifle, so if you're going to use a case fired in one rifle, in another rifle or different rifle, then you want to make sure that you full length resize it. Full length means coming all the way to the head, the base of the head, and touching the shoulder. In this case, this ammunition is going to be used in the same rifle. Now, I usually take a rag or a piece of Kleenex, just wipe that off. And then I would lock the ring in. Now this is provided you're going to shoot this ammunition in the same rifle it was originally fired in. Headspace is determined in a number of ways. With the rimless cartridge like this, your headspace is determined by the distance from the head to the shoulder on the neck. On a belted magnum, your belted magnum cartridges would have a belt here. That determines the headspace. However, it doesn't really, really work that well. And on the rimmed case, like a 3030 or a 32 Special, your headspace is determined by the rim itself, stopping it from going deeper into the chamber. So, with a standard 30 out 6, 270, 308, 243 type case, we, sizing just down to the neck, we have zero headspace, so we know that that ammunition is going to function perfectly in that particular rifle that we used. We use a different procedure on a belted magnum. Or, or excuse me, we use the same procedure as I just showed you on this belted magnum by smoking the case. That keeps the head from becoming separated, especially after numerous firings. I'll give you an example of what could happen to your rifle. Here we have two cases that I fired back in the early 60s when the 7mm Remington Magnum first came out. It was a learning process for me. I was head spacing off of the belt rather than up on the shoulder. The process I just showed you was smoking the case and sizing down and stopping just before you touch the shoulder it gives you zero head space. Therefore, it eliminates all movement of the cartridge in the chamber of the rifle when it's chambered and when it's fired. It starts off, you can see a little bit of a line right here. The, the case head starts to separate from the case body. And if you don't catch it and you reload the case again, eventually you're going to get full head separation from the case body, leaving this portion of the cartridge case stuck in your rifle chamber. And if you're on a hunt in a remote area, and you've traveled by horseback many, many miles and days to get there, and you have this happen, it's going to put you out of commission. So it really is important when you're dealing with belted magnums to size or resize just down until the die touches the top of the case uh, shoulder, and then you back off maybe a sixteenth of a turn. Once we've sized all the cases, we need to check them for uniformity and length. All good re reloading manuals will <clears throat> give the dimensions in this particular case on the odd six. 
that the standard trim length is two inches, 494 thousandths, or 2.494. As you use your, your cases over and over again, they will grow with, uh, with firing and resizing, and then they need to be trimmed. You can go 10 thousandths over this length, but once you get there, that's the maximum length, and they need to be trimmed back to 2.494. Here we have some cartridge cases. <clears throat> we have a rimmed, a rimless, and a belted magnum. These are two different heads, one with a primer in, one cutaway showing the flash hole and the primer pocket. In this particular case, we have a cartridge here that's a 7mm Remington magnum, which is notorious for what we call head separation. On the inside of the case, a crack will develop. And then, upon further firing and reloading, you might end up with a case of total head separation. And if you're on a hunting trip in the backcountry, and this happens to you, you've got a problem trying to get this portion of the cartridge case out of your chamber. It's going to ruin the hunt. So to get away from this, I'll show you a simple procedure on how to set your dies properly for the proper headspace in that particular rifle. But do note that in cases like a 30 out 6 or 30 carbine, anything to be used in an auto loader must be full length resized to function properly through their actions. For cartridges that are going to be going to be fired in the same rifle and I'm not interchanged with any other, and a bolt-action rifle. There's a procedure that I use that works very, very well. It eliminates all head space. Once this case has been fired in the rifle, it fits the chamber of that particular rifle perfectly. So we want to maintain those absolute dimensions, if at all possible, and only neck resize so that the bolt will be held in place. So I just simply use a little bit of lube on the neck, and I always, on every fifth case, put a little bit of lube on the brush on the inside of the neck so that it slides through the expander ball. If you don't lube it occasionally, it gets so dry that as the expander ball comes up through the neck, it will stretch the neck a little bit every single time. Now, the key is to take a cigarette lighter or a uh, candle or something and just blacken the neck just a little bit so we can tell how far the case is going into the die. And we insert it into the die, and I'm going to back off about one turn. And then run the case up into the die. And then we can see that didn't kick the primer out. Just make a minor adjustment here. Once we backed off on that die a little bit, the decapping pin came up. So we'll want to put that down just a little bit deeper. There, until our primer comes out. Now we can clearly see The amount of neck that we've resized. We can go a little bit deeper. So we put the case back in, loosen up the die, and turn it down another half a turn. And do the same procedure until we come down almost to the very, very edge of the neck. Then we know that we're not setting. We're not setting the shoulder on the case back, we're just resizing that portion of the neck. So now we have a perfectly formed cartridge case for that specific rifle that it was fired in. This procedure is only to be used on those car cartridge cases that were used in that particular rifle. Again, this procedure with a 7mm magnum or a belted magnum will eliminate all the head separation problems that you would have had. So I recommend that you set up uh, any belted magnum 
using this procedure of smoking the neck. Now that we've run the cases through the dye, you can see how almost perfect the, the necks are. They're nice and round. After we've resized the cases, sometimes there's a little bit of a sharp edge on the outside. And also we want to leave <clears throat> a little bit of a bevel on the inside of the case neck so that the bullet will seat in, go in very smoothly without scoring or, or defacing the bullet in any way. So we simply use this simple tool, very common tool, available through virtually any hand loaders. Just give it a couple twists on the outside. Same thing, and I rotate the case just like that. And that puts a nice bevel on the inside and takes care of any sharp edges. Here we have a cartridge that's been fired a couple of times without being trimmed. <clears throat> and once we put it into our dial caliper, we can see that it measures exactly uh, one thousandth of an inch under two and a half inches, or 2.99 so it needs to be trimmed we'll use our Wilson trimmer simple little device put it into a vise that's bolted to the workbench insert the cartridge case now note that this cartridge case has been cleaned we always on the uh, once fired brass, we put them in the tumbler and we clean them up. So we insert into the holder. Give it a little tap, just a gentle little tap. And I've already pre-adjusted the trim length so that it will come out correct. And then we just hold it down with our thumb. Tighten that up just a little bit. And you can see the brass is being cut off. And it will automatically stop when it comes to the right length. In this case, we're removing quite a bit. Now our new trim length, or our new length after trimming, would be 2.483, or 484 within one thousandth of what the manual calls for as a trim length. Very simple procedure, but once we do this, it leaves sharp edges inside the case mouth and also on the outside. So we just give it a very gentle tap, and we use our deburring tool. There we have a cartridge case that's trimmed, deburred, and ready for primers and powder. Here we can see the correct trim length. I misstated uh, before I trimmed this, and I said that the dimensions were uh, 2.99. It was 2.499. Now after trimming, it's 2.483. See on the next disc. Here we have an RCBS hand priming tool. There's a number of different tools available. Uh, there, there's always a standard one that comes with the press, so we'll cover both types. In this situation, we have uh, a small seater. We have a large seater, large rifle or large pistol, or small rifle, small pistol. This is a preloaded strip of primers. In this case, we're using standard large rifle primers. This is a little tool. It's a wrench for screwing in the new uh, primer seeders. The way that works is very simply, we're going to use the large. So we take the large seeder and put it inside the tool, squeeze the handle all the way back, insert it in the hole, and turn it down until it stops. And we have our cedar positioned inside the hand priming tool and we're ready to prime. The strip is loaded this way. And now you can see the primer inside. We're ready to put cartridge cases in and start priming. 
we simply insert a cartridge case until it snaps, squeeze the handle firmly, and you can feel the primer seat into the primer pocket. Very simple procedure. Now, let's move to the reloading press system. Our press comes equipped with a standard priming arm. This particular one has a large uh, rifle uh, primer seater in it now. But if you, if you needed to change it, the simple way to do it is to push down on the collar, which exposes a small hole. And I've got a piece of toothpick here. And just with that toothpick, just turn it just like this until it unscrews itself. And you simply remove the large assembly and replace it with the small assembly for the smaller primers. Then to assemble it, put it back in the hole, and turn it in. Here we have two cartridge cases. We have a new one, which would naturally have a clean primer pocket, and we have a once-fired case. You can see how well the residue is built up around the inside. We like to just kind of clean that out a little bit. And after we've tumbled the cartridges, sometimes the tumbling media will get stuck in the flash hole. So it's very, very important to take a toothpick and stick it in the flash hole if you see anything in there and blow on it gently and that way it will be clear. Otherwise you will not get proper ignition. I'm going to use an RCBS tool, hand tool, and insert it into the primer pocket. Just give it a couple of twists. And you can see now that it is relatively clean. There's not any residue in there that's going to interfere with the ignition. It's extremely important to make sure that you have very, very clean hands before you handle any primers because any oil from your hands that gets on a primer could neutralize it and cause a misfire. I've had it happen to me many, many, many years ago. So I've adopted a policy of always washing my hands very carefully to remove all oil because we have to pick up a primer. So we'll take one of these large rifle primers, insert it into the cup, just like that, place a case into the shell holder, and note that I've removed the die because when it goes up, you just don't want to take any chances or having it bump something or knock your new primer out. So run it to the top of the stroke, Push in the priming arm, pull down until you feel the primer seat, and then when you release, it pops out automatically, and you have a primed case. Either way works just perfectly fine. Here I've poured out tiny, tiny examples of eight different powders. Uh, however, there are literally well over a hundred different types of powders on the market. The point I'm trying to make here is never assume that you know what kind of powder it is. Never store powder in a container other than the original container because identifying these powders is virtually impossible. And if you mix one up, you could cause a catastrophic problem with your firearm or with yourself, personal injury. We've got some light ball powders. We have this particular one. The second one is standard 4831 Hodgdon's. This is their shortcut version. They both have exactly the same burning rate. However, the shortcut meters through meters much more accurately. Then we have a flake type powder. But as you can see, the sizes vary. Some of them are almost identical. And it's so easy to make a mistake. When you're working with powders, always keep the powder container on your clean countertop when you're working. That way, if anything is left over in the measure the next day, you know that it goes into the only container that's on your bench. Here I have pages from two reloading manuals, one from Hodgdon's, which is a powder manufacturer. The other one is from Hornaday, a bullet manufacturer. And I like to use 
a bullet manufacturer's manual and a powder manufacturer's manual because a powder manufacturer's manual will use other manufacturers bullets so you get a cross-section of the different bullet companies whereas Hornaday will only show you the data on the Hornaday bullets but an interesting thing here is if you compare powders if you take H4350 with a 165 grain bullet it's showing a maximum load of 57.9 grains where when you check the Hodgdon manual for the same bullet weight, 165 grains with the same powder, you'll find a maximum load of 59 grains. So there's a difference of a couple, well, about a, a grain or so. That doesn't mean that one is better than the other or one is safer. It just means that the manual data was collected under different, different conditions, possibly different barrel lengths whatever, variables. So what you do as a as a, uh, uh, a person who wants to make a good hand load, you have to start somewhere. And we're not going to cover that with this. We're just going to pick out a load. And I happen to have a load that I've been using that is 56.5 grains of IMR4350 with 165 grain nozzler ballistic tip. So we're going to go ahead and use that load. We'll have to start on part three. This is the way our reloading bench should look as we prepare to charge the cases with powder. Make sure your surface is perfectly clean and there's nothing that's going to get in your way or confuse you. Both of these units are manufactured by RCBS. The one on the left has a smaller drum inside for metering pistols, small charges of pistol powders. And the one on the right I've got set up for a larger volume centerfire rifle cartridges. The difference between the two is this one has the basic screw adjustment on it. And the one on the right has a micrometer adjustment, which makes repeatability considerably more accurate and much faster. If you don't have a powder measure, the good old basic custard dish in a small spoon will allow you to pick up whatever powder you need to put into the scale. Here I'm using the RCBS 510 scale. Most scales are pretty much the same, but it's very, very critical that you learn and understand what each individual marking means. The first thing we need to do is to level the scale for the work surface. Here we can see that we're off slightly. So if we turn this screw until the indicator points to zero, that is provided you have all of the weights here and here set at zero. Now our scale is level and we're ready to throw a powder charge. It's extremely important to read your owner's manual and become familiar with the settings on every individual scale. Most of them are pretty much the same, but there are differences. Also, most catastrophic failures or, uh, let's say, overloads that might cause a rifle to blow up and cause some very serious injuries uh, have been traced back to improper setting of the scale, and they have caused uh, the loader to put in too much powder, very simply. So it's very, very important that we understand the settings on the scale. <clears throat> on the main bar, each line on this bar is 10 grains. So we're going to use 56.5 grains of powder. So we very simply move this to the 50 position. To pick up our five grains, we come over to the wheel I'll just take this pan off and dial the wheel until this line comes up to the six. And there we're at the six. Now to pick up our half a grain, each line with the numbers one, two, three, four, five, there's five. So we stop it right there, 
turn the little nylon set screw. And there we have 56.5 grains. Now we're ready to throw our charge into the pan and weigh it. Throwing a charge without a powder measure is not that difficult. You just take a little spoon and add some powder until the beam starts to come up and level. <clears throat> and if we put too much in, we can just take a little bit out. There you can see we're about a tenth of a grain off. So we just take out maybe three or four pieces of powder. And now we're right on. It's that simple. Now we'll load up the powder, powder uh, measure and we'll throw directly from the measure. First we need to take the powder charge that we just threw and put it into a cartridge case. We use a funnel. And then we put it all the way to the far side of the cartridge board with the neck up. That way we can look down inside it and verify that it has a powder charge in it. The first thing we need to do is to add some powder to the hopper. So we'll take the powder out of our custard dish and pour it in. And then we'll add from the can. I'll fill it about 30% of the way up because we're not going to do that many. Now that we've got some powder in the hopper, we'll go ahead and uh, try to set it for 56.5 grains of powder. Well, we see that we're a little bit light. So we need to open up the hopper a little bit more to allow more powder to flow in. Notice that I push the pan up against the very, very bottom of the powder measure. That way it keeps the powder from splashing out of the pan. I have repeatability with this because when I bring it to the upstroke, I have exactly the same movement every single time. That would ensure consistency. Now I've brought that up a little ways. Looks like I'm getting pretty lucky. We need to open it just a little bit more. Now we're just a wee tad too heavy, so we'll just make a, another adjustment and bring it right to zero. Now that we're pretty close, we're within, oh, probably a grain or so. I've added some powder to the uh, powder trickler, and we'll just add a tiny bit until the indicator comes up dead level. Now this is a very, very accurate way of doing things, but it's very slow. <clears throat> Once you work at using the powder measure quite a bit, you'll develop a technique where you will be consistent with how you click the handle up as the powder goes into the hopper. You click it twice to help settle the powder in. Now we'll just take the powder from the pan and transfer it into the cartridge case. Put it in the block, and we're ready to do another one. Now you can see we're a little heavy. So we just simply remove a little bit of powder. Sometimes it takes a little while to get these adjustments balanced just perfectly.
and we can see that we're oh, less than a tenth of a grain, which is more than adequate. The powder charge is not as critical as most people might think. You can be off a tenth of a grain. For hunting loads, it doesn't make any difference at all. If you're going to shoot bench rest or competition target, that's a different ball game. Now we'll go ahead and charge all of these cases. And if we do charge directly from the powder measure itself, we want to weigh every fifth to tenth charge to make sure that they're all consistent. Once we've established our consistency with the scale, we can go directly and dispense from the powder measure into the cartridge case. Now as a final check, we'll throw our one of our last charges into the powder pan, put it on the scale, and verify that nothing has changed. Now we can see that we have maintained our accuracy, it's dead on. So we'll charge the last four cases and then we will seat bullets. Before bullet seating, we want to visually make a check of every single case to make sure that the powder charge appears to look the same in each and every one. If there's ever any question as to whether one might have too much or too little, <clears throat> take that case and reweigh it. In this case, they all look very good, so we're ready to seat bullets. Here we have seven different bullets starting with a 218B through a 260 grain Nosler AccuBond 375. Of note, the 218B has a crimping groove or cantilever. The 170 grain has a crimp groove, as does the 375 H&H. &H. <laughs> this happens to be a 70 grain Barnes triple shock. It, these are not crimping grooves, however, bullets can be crimped into them if, if a person desires to, but it's not necessary. The standard bullets without crimping grooves are held into the cartridge case by friction and friction alone. This is a bullet seating die made up of a tube, a lock ring, and a bullet seating stem. That's what it looks like when it's all assembled inside the die and the bullet goes up into the ram. To replace this, we have to go through the bottom and insert a screwdriver into this end. And we do it by putting a little bit of, little bit of pressure here with a pencil, inserting the screwdriver in and turning it until we can see the stem come up through the top and then we can grab a hold of it with our fingers like this and screw it all the way up as far as it'll go. This prevents the bullet from initially being seated too deep into the case. So we'll just bring that right up to the top and then insert it into the press. Setting the bullet seating die is a very simple procedure. The first thing we do is take a charged case loaded with powder, put it into the shell holder, and run it to the top of the press stroke. Then we screw the bullet seating die all the way down until it stops on the cartridge case mouth. Then we give it one turn counterclockwise. I'll use the set screw as an indicator. So there we've turned it counterclockwise one full turn. Now we bring down our lock ring until it stops. And then we tighten it.
Now we're ready to adjust the bullet seating depth. Now I take the bullet that we've chosen, this is a 165 grain ballistics tip, insert it into the bullet's case mouth, then run the die up to the top of the stroke, and then turn the stem down. You see it's already made contact, but you can see it has a long way to go. So we're going to make a comparison between one of the other loaded rounds that we have so that we come up with the correct seating depth for this load. This is what it should look like from the bottom. When the ram comes up, the decapping pin and the case go up inside and the primer is kicked out. If for any reason it doesn't kick out, you simply make another adjustment and give it another turn until the primers come out on a consistent basis. After we've resized the cases, sometimes there's a little bit of a sharp edge on the outside and also we want to leave <clears throat> a little bit of a bevel on the inside of the case neck so that the bullet will seat in, go in very smoothly without scoring or or defacing the bullet in any way. So we simply use this simple tool, very common tool, available through virtually any hand loaders. Just give it a couple twists on the outside. Same thing and I rotate the case just like that. And that puts a nice bevel on the inside and takes care of any sharp edges. Here we have a cartridge that's been fired a couple of times without being trimmed. <clears throat> and once we put it into our dial caliper, we can see that it measures exactly uh, one thousandth of an inch under two and a half inches, or <clears throat> two point nine nine. So it needs to be trimmed. We'll use our Wilson trimmer, simple little device, <clears throat> put it into a vise that's bolted to the workbench, insert the cartridge case. Now note that this cartridge case has been cleaned. We always on the uh, once fired brass, we put them in the tumbler and we clean them up. So we insert into the holder. Give it a little tap, just a gentle little tap, and I've already pre-adjusted the trim length so that it will come out correct. And then we just hold it down with our thumb, tighten that up just a little bit, and you can see the brass is being cut off. And it will automatically stop when it comes to the right length. In this case, we're removing quite a bit. Now our new trim length, or our new length after trimming, would be 2.483, or 484, within one thousandth of what the manual calls for as a trim length. Very simple procedure, but once we do this, it leaves sharp edges inside the case mouth and also on the outside. So we just give it a very gentle tap and we use our deburring tool and there we have a cartridge case that's trimmed, deburred and ready for primers and powder. Here we can see the correct trim length. I misstated uh, before I trimmed this, and I said that the dimensions were uh, 2.99. It was 2.499. Now, after trimming, it's 2.483. See on the next disc.